Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. So the subject title we see on the screen, Salvation by Grace Through Faith, it's not really a controversial one at face value, is it? We can all agree, and I think most denominations would agree um, th with that as a subject title, that salvation is by grace and through faith. But although many people would agree with us, um, g given that, that that is a verse that we've just read in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and not, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, although many people would agree with with us on, on this subject uh, title. What we will see is the subject, particularly of salvation, it, it is possible uh, to, to go very far astray uh, from Bible teaching on this subject. And that, that is what I would I thought we would start with, really, is just how far astray it's possible to go from the simplicity that we see in the gospel um, and the simplicity um, as we say of, of, of this lecture subject, salvation by grace through faith. Because why uh, is this an important subject? Thinking really about the, the subject of salvation and, and how we obtain salvation. And, and just as an example, which we'll follow through uh, for, for a short while, that just, just to see how far astray you can go when you think about salvation and how it is obtained. Because in 1515, Pope Leo X, he granted something called a plenary indulgence, which was intended to finance the construction of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Um, and it would apply this, this plenary indulgence that you could purchase from a priest. It would apply to almost any sin. So a letter that you would get from the priest on behalf of the church, which would absolve you from almost any sin, including adultery and theft. And as I say, we'll follow this through for a few slides and just see where it can lead because Johann Tetzel, the picture of him there on the right, um, he was commissioned by the Roman Catholic Church to preach and offer this indulgence because they were looking to finance uh, the building of Saint or the renovation of St. Peter's Basilica. Um, and he was commissioned to preach and offer this indulgence. And he campaigned in cities near Wittenberg and he drew many uh, local parishioners, if you like. They would travel to, to these cities from Wittenberg uh, and they would purchase um, indulgences. And this is the famous quote which is attributed to Johann Tetzel. As soon as the gold in the casket rings, the rescued soul to heaven springs. And we quickly see how, uh, how, how far it is possible to fall away from the simplicity of the salvation which we know is offered by God, um, not uh, indeed not for money, without, uh, without money and without price, as we read in Isaiah. But um, as I say, we'll follow it through um, and see what, what it led to, because I'm sure you're all familiar with it. So Martin Luther, um, he became especially concerned in 1517, so he was, um, um, he was based in Wittenberg uh, and he became especially concerned in 1517 when his parishioners, returning from purchasing Tetzel's indulgences, claimed that they no longer needed to repent and change their lives in order to be forgiven of sin because they purchased these indulgences. And as I'm sure we're all aware, Martin Luther, uh, he was the man who was responsible for writing what they, they refer to as these 95 theses, which were pinned to the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg, because he took exception to this, to this practice. Uh, Leo X was decadent. Uh, he was a decadent pope. And I think the, there's a, re a reputed uh, comment that, that Leo the, the X said, um, when 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 he was uh, when, when he was the pope um, that he said we God has given us the papacy uh, let us enjoy it um, and so they had enjoyed it and, and and really the reason for selling these indulgences was avarice and greed and these 95 theses 
I didn't realize that actually uh, these things are only a line or two a line or two long and you can see a picture of of them in two columns there but specifically I've I've highlighted number 27 and 28 out of these 95 theses uh, number 27 they preach only human doctrines who say that as soon as the money clinks into the money chest the soul flies out of purgatory um, and, and what he then says in uh, number 28 it, it is certain that when money clicks into the money chest greed and avarice can be increased now I hope this uh, anecdote is true um, but um, if, if it is it, it's quite funny so Luther claimed that Johann Tetzel there he is again who had received a substantial amount of money at Leipzig from a nobleman who asked him for a letter of indulgence for a future sin that he was going to commit and supposedly Tetzel answered in the affirmative insisting that the payment had to be made at once and so the, nom the nobleman paid uh, for, for this indulgence and he received a letter and a seal from Tetzel However, when Tetzel left Leipzig, the nobleman attacked him along the way, gave him a thorough beating, sending him back empty handed to Leipzig with the comment that it was the future sin which he had in mind when he purchased the indulgence. So hopefully that is a, a true story. That's what Luther claims. Uh, but I, I thought that was uh, a bit comical if, 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 if that's true. But whilst we might think of that something uh, th this was something that went on in, in the Middle Ages indulgences are still something they are still a doctrine that is that is preached by the Catholic Church and you can still purchase indulgences they they obviously don't go near any more uh, purchasing indulgences for 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 dead relatives I think they, they they're very wary of that uh, but but as we read on this slide the catechism of the Catholic Church describes an indulgence as a remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven which the faithful Christian who is duly disposed gains and we've highlighted a couple of things in blue here just to to show the the distance that, that, that this doctrine is from the simplicity of the gospel the the faithful Christian who is duly disposed gains under certain prescribed conditions through the action of the church so we read that salvation and the grace of God we read in Ephesians chapter 2 uh, was a gift from God but this is through the actions of the church apparently which as the minister of redemption so the, the, the assuming this role as the minister of redemption the church dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of the satisfactions of Christ and all the saints and so we can quickly see um, the responsibilities and the authorities which they're taking to themselves here in the matter of of salvation um, and one of the indulgences that they list um, on that website there www.vaticanva devoting oneself or one's goods compassionately in a spirit of faith to the service of one's brothers and sisters in need and of course we would agree with that wouldn't we we would agree with that as something that we should do <coughs> devote oneself or one's goods compassionately in a spirit of faith to the service of one's brothers and sisters in need but certainly the way that it is it is portrayed and in, in, in how they take the authority to themselves uh, uh, take the authority upon themselves as the church as the minister uh, of redemption it is certainly something we would disagree with but that's just a, an example to show how far astray you can fall from the simplicity of the gospel but we'll we'll turn now to Ephesians chapter 2 and see what is the the real teaching um, in relation to salvation and we'll just run through a few verses now in Ephesians chapter 2 that we that we read and we read in the first verse Paul writes and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins and that's the important thing isn't it that we were we were dead in trespasses and sins there was no hope for us um, but it's God who hath quickened us um, not uh, the church the minister of redemption we were dead in trespasses 
and sins and down to verse 3 among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others paul makes it very clear that we are all in need uh, of forgiveness we are all dead in our sins or we were dead in our sins um, in times past um, but it's god who is able to provide salvation for us and we see that now in in verse 4 but god not uh, the church god who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins god hath quickened us together with christ by grace ye are saved and down to verse 8 which is the verse where we take our subject heading from for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god it's not something that can be sold for money it is the gift of god not of works lest any man should boast so these indulgences that we read about in the modern church that you can purchase are to do with works you can't purchase salvation through works the the scriptures are very clear on that not of works lest any man should boast the only work involved and it's uh, no surprise i think that this vo this verse verse 10 follows uh, the fact that, it, that grace is the gift of god not not of works the only work involved is in verse 10 we we are the workmanship of god created in christ jesus unto good works which god hath before ordained that we should walk in them so the good works that we may or may not be uh, inspired to do and what we should be inspired to do these good works they are a response to the grace of god that we have received we don't do them uh, to obtain salvation they are works that we do in response to the to the to the salvation and the grace uh, of, of god that we have received and down into the next chapter ephesians 3 because our subject heading was in verse 8 for by grace are ye saved through faith and down into chapter 3 of ephesians in verse 8 we read uh, paul who was so grateful wasn't he so grateful for the grace that he'd received because of the way he had persecuted the early uh, church he of all people was most grateful for the grace that he'd received unto me who am less than the least of all the saints is this grace given that i should preach among the gentiles the unsearchable riches of christ and we down to verse 11 according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in christ jesus our lord so this was all an action of god not of the church it was god's purpose and he purposed it in christ jesus our lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him so it's the faith in christ that we need to show um, which will enable this this grace that we have received this unmerited favor that we've received from god um, to work in our lives and let's concentrate then on this this word grace for a few moments the the greek word that we read uh, grace uh, in this chapter uh, and elsewhere in, uh, in in the new testament occurs over i think 150 times in the new testament thea's greek lexicon gives a, a couple of good definitions of, of what what grace is so it is goodwill loving kindness favor uh, and this is this is from god in the context that we read it uh, moreover the word charis uh, or caris grace contains the idea of kindness which bestows upon one what he has not deserved and uh, the third bullet point i think is really useful here from thea's greek lexicon the new testament writers use caris preeminently of that kindness by which god bestows favors even upon the ill-deserving and grants to sinners the pardon of their offenses and bids them accept of eternal salvation through christ and that's the important point here it's the unmerited favor and the kindness that we receive of god on the sinners the undeserving uh, he offers us the pardon of our offenses so 
Romans is another place in the New Testament where we can go to find out a lot more about grace. Romans chapter 5. And there's some nice contrasts in this passage, uh, this, these few verses in Romans chapter 5, between verse 15 and verse 18. There's some nice contrasts that the Apostle draws out um, in relation to grace. Because Paul says, but not as the offence is the free gift. For if through the offence of one many be dead, so Adam, because of Adam's sin, uh, that, that, that death has passed upon all men because of Adam's sin. So if through the offence of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So there's the first contrast that Ad through Adam's sin, death passed upon all men, but the righteousness, uh, uh, through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, um, which came uh, through the grace of God and the gift by grace, um, through through the actions of, of, of God and, and his son, the Lord Jesus, this grace, this gift of grace hath abounded unto many, just as Adam's sin uh, came upon, the, the, the consequences of Adam's sin came upon all men. The grace of God is, is available to, to all men. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offences unto justification. And that's an interesting contrast as well, isn't it? Because there was one sin. The judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift, so there was one sin which caused the, the consequences of sin to pass on, on all of us. And we may, we may say that we didn't ask for it. We didn't ask for Adam's, uh, the consequence of Adam's sin to be passed upon us. But the free gift is of many offences unto justification. So Adam sinned once and, and the results of that affect us down to this day. But the free gift of God, this gift of grace from God, the free gift is of many offences unto justification. We've committed, we, each of us here have committed many sins, uh, but the free gift is of many offences unto justification. So we may feel hard done by having suffered the consequences of what Adam did. But we have we have sinned many times, um, but we're able to be justified um, by God. And we carry on. For if by one man's offence death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offence of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Back a chapter to Romans 4 for another uh, lesson that we can learn about, about uh, grace. Because we read in Romans chapter 4 and verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And we read, don't we, we read further now to him that that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So if we work for something, uh, we, we earn it, don't we? Uh, it's a debt that someone owes to us. To him that worketh is the reward reckoned uh, not of grace, but of debt. Um, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Uh, and so this is not something that we can obtain through works, through, um, through the church telling us that if we go and do these works, we can obtain redemption for our sins. It's nothing to do with works. It's we are asked to believe on him that justifieth the ungodly and that faith will be counted to us for righteousness. Still on the same theme turn a few pages forward to Romans chapter 11 <clears throat> just to finish this point that Paul was making uh, about faith rather than works Hebrew uh, sorry Romans 11 and verse 5 
where Paul says, Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. And perhaps there are a couple of passages that we can turn to, in fact, which explicitly condemn the actions that we were looking at earlier, these, these indulgences. Um, and we're still in Romans, so turn to, to Romans chapter 6. Because we read, we read didn't we, of um, that Johann Tetzel selling indulgences. Um, almost encouraging people that they were able to sin. Um, but that's not what, what Paul says in Romans 6. Romans 6 verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. So just because we have received this grace doesn't mean... Uh, that, that we can go out and, uh, and sin um, and sin further. It's not something that Paul is uh, condoning mm. at all. And turn to, to Jude because perhaps there's another condemnation of this behavior that we can that we can see because Martin Luther recognized, uh, didn't he, that it was greed and avarice that was driving the church to behave that way. Um, but in Jude and verse 4 we read, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw that, didn't we? We saw that they were denying God and Jesus Christ and, and taking the authority to themselves. But they turned the grace of God into lasciviousness, which is a terrible thing, isn't it? And um, surely something for which uh, God will visit. Perhaps uh, worth us now just, just considering um, a couple of wrong doctrines on grace. We've, we've looked at what, what I think is fairly straightforward teaching about uh, the grace of God, this unmerited favour that we've, we, we've received, but that it is faith uh, that, that will save us and not, not works. Some fairly straightforward teaching. But there's, again, some very wrong doctrines about grace, which is probably worth us addressing, which you may come across, um, and perhaps some suggested verses which um, disprove these wrong doctrines. Because Calvinists believe in something called irresistible grace, which teaches that the saving grace of God is effectually applied to those he has determined to save and that in God's timing this will overcome their resistance to obeying the call of the gospel. So there's a view that uh, if God has decided that you will be saved then you will be saved. Uh, his grace will overcome any resistance that you have to it um, and this is a view that, that certain denominations including the Calvinists have. But it's something that we think is, is quite easily uh, dis disproved. Back in Romans, um, Romans chapter 10. And we find, don't we, that in Romans 10 and verse 13, we read, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's an action that we need to, uh, that we need to make if we, if we wish to be saved. It's not just a, a one-way thing coming from God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord uh, shall be saved. Uh, and, and further down, um, further down in, in, in Romans chapter 10, um, we read in verse 16, um, But they have not all obeyed the call uh, of the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So this, the, 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 this idea of irresistible grace doesn't seem to tie in, does it, with what we read in uh, the New Testament? Because it's clearly stated that not everyone has obeyed the call of the gospel. Um, there are plenty that don't believe the call of the gospel. 
But it goes on to say that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And further down, uh, further down the last verse of Romans chapter 10, we can make the point even further where God says, but to Israel, he saith, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. They were not the, 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 the Israelites of the Old Testament. They were able to resist, weren't they? They were able to resist uh, the grace of God because God stretched his hands forth to them all day long. But they were disobedient and gainsaying. There is still a response required from us. Uh, regardless of any grace that has been shown to us by God. And another point which we would make is there are verses and passages that we can turn to to show that even though the grace of God has been shown to us and even though we may have responded to that, uh, that God's graciousness and we may have shown faith, um, it is possible that we could fall from this high calling um, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 where we read be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life that faith that we need to show rather than works that faith has to be something that we show unto death and only then will we be given a crown of life it's not something that once we are once we have been given the grace of god we are saved we there is still an ongoing uh, responsibility that we have uh, to respond to that and similarly in revelation chapter 16 we read behold i come as a thief blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame so those two verses from revelation would indicate that it certainly is possible to fall from uh, any position of favor that we have been um, given from God. Further wrong doctrine that we come across is in the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church believe that the sacraments, so they have various sacraments such as baptism um, and, and, and um, sharing of uh, the, the Eucharist um, and these sacraments um, the Catholics believe that the sacraments confer grace. The sacred mysteries or the sacraments are seen as the means of partaking of divine grace. And what they also believe is that unless a soul is in the state of grace at the moment of death, it cannot achieve the beatific vision, whatever that is. But um, they believe that we need to be in a state of grace at the moment of death and hence that is why we have this ritual another sacrament uh, the last rites because they try to put the, the individual in a state of grace at the moment of death but it's not what we find is it in the scripture these these uh, these are just wrong doctrines that we see and, and they're not um, they're, they're not what God describes in the scripture Turn to Hebrews 11, please. And we'll finish in Hebrews 11. Because, of course, our subject is salvation through grace by faith. And Hebrews 11 is the best chapter we could go to, isn't it? To, to illustrate the faith that we need to show to, to obtain salvation. And Hebrews 11 and... We'll go in at verse 12. Therefore sprang there even of one, Abram, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They didn't die in a state of grace. They died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them. And just as perhaps a final example of, of, of what, it, what it means to, to die in faith, 
uh, and how these doctrines that, that, that we come across in elsewhere are, are, are so far from the gospel, down to verse 22 of Hebrews 11. Because we read, don't we, that by faith, Joseph, when he died, we don't read about Joseph having any last rights to put his soul in a state of grace. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. He didn't want the last rites. He wanted his bones to be taken into Israel because he believed in a future resurrection and he wanted to be in Israel when the resurrection from the dead happens, which we hope and pray we may also be beneficiaries of. And we'll conclude with the last two verses of Hebrews chapter 11. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Thank you.